In recent weeks, I have noticed more than ever before that experts, they disagree. Economists disagree. Physicians disagree on the diagnosis and best treatment of a particular disease or virus. Scientists, they disagree on the value of a mask or washing hands or the distance to safely stay away from someone else in this social distancing or if indeed being distant helps at all. Christ followers, they even disagree on a number of things and issues. We disagree because to live is to change and to disagree is to be human. But we should be cautious about becoming disagreeable. And I've noticed something recently on our campus here. We have three ponds, and they are filled now with tadpoles, and they are transitioning into frogs. And, and are you aware of the tremendous advantage that frogs have over humans? They can eat anything that bugs them. I happen to think, wouldn't it be great if we could just consume relational problems rather than letting them consume us? So I'm going to ask a rhetorical question. What bugs you? Bugs you most about disagreeable people or difficult people? I know we, we need to be honest. There are some people to whom we disagree with we just maybe don't like. And they don't like us. We don't like uh, people who make us feel inferior. We don't like people who always think they're always right. We don't care for people who find fault with everything, but yet have no constructive solutions for anything. We don't like people who pretend to be what they are not. We don't like people who view everything in life in terms of what it will mean to their own comfort and success. Yet, there is hope when we disagree. For sure, there are difficult people, but there are few impossible people. A seemingly impossible person, I am convinced, are persons who are ill. There is a mental deficiency. There is an emotional frustration. And any person, though, who is normal with reasonable mental facilities is a possible person. Every person has a door in their soul through which you can find some common ground. But we need to go further than just finding common ground. Jesus taught the test of Christian discipleship is not how well we get along when there is agreement, but how are we with those to whom we disagree with? The test of Christian discipleship is to be able to love people we disagree with or maybe not even like. Jesus was very quick to the point when he said, love your enemies. Last Sunday in the Mother's Day message, I mentioned there are those three words for love in biblical Greek language. We, each one of those carry a very different meaning. There's the eros, there's philia, there's agape. And how a mother's love is like that agape kind of love of God. Agape is ascribed to the love of God. It is a love that is not dependent upon lovableness of another person or upon shared interests or agreement. It arises from the recognition of the needs of other people. It has no hidden motive or, as Paul put it in his letter to the church at Corinth, Love does not insist on its own way. Agape emphasizes this free will aspect of love. The determination to seek the good of the one who is loved. And in the Bible, whenever love is commanded as a duty towards our neighbor or towards a disagreeable person, it is always agape love that is used. And at the same time, we could put it down as a fact that Jesus never says that we must like everyone. What he commands is that we desire their welfare, that we seek their highest good, whether we like them or not. There is also a second part to Jesus' direction for dealing with difficult people or people we disagree with. 
Do good to those who hate you, he said in Luke. In this passage surrounding our Bible reading, Jesus says that the Christian will not demand an eye for an eye, but will turn the other cheek. And the Apostle Paul, in his letter to Rome, put the matter in a very unforgettable fashion. He said this, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Why do this? Because that is the mark of a Christian. It is also, I would say, the mark of a Christian nation. Jesus went on to say, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I like what Eric Klinenberg had to say in an article on distance and solidarity. He said, forget social distancing. What we need is physical distancing and social solidarity. There is hope in pandemic times. A number of years ago, a researcher performed an experiment to see the effects of hope on those undergoing hardships. Two sets of laboratory rats were placed in separate tubs of water. The researchers left one set in the water and found that within an hour, they had all drowned. The other rats were periodically lifted out of the water and then returned. And when that happened, the second set of rats swam for over 24 hours. Why? Not because they were given a rest, but because they suddenly had hope. Those animals somehow hoped that if they could just stay afloat long enough, someone would reach down and rescue them. Now, if hope holds such power for rodents, how much greater can its effect be on our lives? God reaches for us through Jesus the Christ. There are times when his uplifting power is realized, and there are times when we are placed back in the waters of despair to, to swim and to struggle. And when this happens, have hope in the promises of God that we are not abandoned to drown in a sea of hopelessness. For there are no hopeless situations when we disagree. Amen.